Right. So, um, I want to talk about SVG um, because I've been working with SVG recently. To put it in context, it's an image format. Um, you will no doubt be familiar with image formats like JPEG, PNG, and GIF, or Ping and GIF if you go by what the creators of these formats want. Who does? So SVG is scalable vector graphics. You're no doubt familiar with an, sticking an image tag with a PNG or a JPEG or whatever. You can do exactly that with an SVG. Um, so that's one way of using them. Um, here are two images. This one is an SVG image and this one is a PNG. Um, and the S, as I mentioned, stands for scalable. So if we just tell it to be a bigger size, then the scalable one is nice and crisp, scaled up, and the PNG obviously gets a bit blurry because basically the browser has to make stuff up. It doesn't know how to fill the space other than duplicating pixels, so it ends up being quite blocky or quite blurry. Um, this particular image, you'll notice it started out smaller, considerably smaller than the other one. Um, and if you wanted a PNG image that appeared crisp like this one at this size, it would be much bigger again. So um, image size can be an advantage for certain types of, of images. Um, you can use um, Inkscape. It's a popular open source editor for um, dealing with SVG images. Um, and having made an image, um, you can go into the document properties and, and crop the, the document to the size of the image. Um, you can also um, include SVG in your CSS. Um, in this case, um, I base64 encoded it. Um, some people recommend against that because if you if you do, it ends up a bit bigger, and it's just a text format. So as long as you're careful with your quoting and, and escaping of any hash characters that might be in there, then you can just put the SVG directly in your CSS. In this case, what I was doing was putting custom bullets on, on just a bullet list. Um, so SVG is... Um, an XML format. Um, here you can see there's a rect tag for rectangle and this is what it produces. Um, there's a circle tag for circles and ellipses. Um, there's text for putting text in there um, and then there's um, a path for arbitrary um, move drawing lines between coordinates, um, straight lines or curved lines with Bezier curves, all of that is possible. This is an example of an SVG image that you can create using just the, the rect elements, rectangles. Um, you can also, in your HTML, so here's a div, just put the SVG directly. Now, that the advantage of that um, is that then your CSS can refer to elements within the SVG. So for example here I've got um, a hover effect in CSS that's applying to parts of my SVG image. Um, similarly JavaScript can also interact with elements in the SVG. And you could um, even create a whole user interface using SVG. So this is one that um, I built um, last year. And that's HTML with some SVG images in it. This is one SVG image with lots of interactive elements in it. Um, and one of the things that allows you to do is scale and adapt to the screen size. So if I put it on a mobile screen, then it would adapt to look like this. And one of the things that, that you might notice if you're sharp-eyed 
is that there are now four rows of buttons where some of the buttons are smaller, whereas previously there were five rows of buttons because we had a lot of vertical space. So you can do that sort of thing. Um, in terms of accessibility, um, you would need to be careful with SVG. Um, this particular app um, responds to, to keyboard input because that's the sort of app it, it, it was intended to be. So from that perspective, the accessibility is not too bad, but there are other aspects of accessibility that I haven't uh, given a lot of consideration to um, and probably should. Um, back here, ah, no, sorry, ignore that. Um, when you have paths in your SVG, um, you can um, put dotted lines on them and you can adjust whether they're dots or dashes of particular lengths by changing this, this stroke dash array thing. And one of the things that um, you can do is you can ask via JavaScript how long the path is and you can set its dash array to be that long, so it's effectively one dash that fills the whole path, followed by one space the same length, and then you can animate that either from JavaScript or CSS so that the um, path gets drawn in, um, which is kind of cool. Um, I found this, this document on this image online, a guy um, makes um, pictures that are one line where, where he just draws all around the place within an outline um, and then um, it's one line from start to finish. It, it actually doesn't have a beginning and an end because he, he sort of joins it up. Um, but this is meant to be a lightning talk so we're not going to dwell on that. So if you are interested, there's some links there and these slides will be on the website afterwards. So um, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Started with a with frustratingly trying to create animated SVGs and starting with the lines and then thinking, well, I would really like to be able to create more than just uh, just lines. And so this is going to be a one-handed uh, text editor thing. So we'll see, we'll see where I get to. Um, this project actually got on, uh, I'm, I'm not the creator of Manum. Uh, if you follow YouTube, I think it's three brown, one black uh, as, a, as a very, sorry? Three blue, one brown. Blue, one brown. Uh, he's a really popular YouTuber and his videos are characterized with wonderful animations. His library for creating those animations is an open source Python thing. And, and I just want to kind of demonstrate uh, some of its capabilities to you now. So we start off with, um, with some blank imports. He's a, and uh, what else should we do? I need to kind of create a class. I'm just going to create an animation. Uh, this is quite difficult with, with just one. I, I should have. You can be a microphone. And we need this kind of. Oh, you're very good. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so we need to have a, uh, a kind of a weird thing called construct and I can start by creating let's say a square and then I, I kind of create my square except capitalization doesn't want to work because I'm on you know I'm doing it live so of course it doesn't want to work and then I add it to the scene and write square cool and so over on the right I've got a terminal so uh, I've um, just kind of used the uh, and then if I go up here, delete some stuff, I've got a scene, the scene file, scene.py is the file that I'm now, I ask for animation, and then I say, please give me a preview, and then QL actually stands for quality low. Oh, goodness me. 
Ah, oh, see, I cheated, and it's revealed my cheat. Battery's running out in four minutes. Oh, awesome. Okay, uh, stand by. What sort of Why is that not even? Ah, uh, it's all breaking. Is it USB-C? Yeah, it's not. It's, uh, I'm going to do another one, and then I'm going to go get my... We'll do flying cubes, because that's fun. I run and it's breaking again because, of course, it would. The way, where am I? Uh, I need to be in the flying cubes directory, which is where I was. Animation. It's still not working because this is a live demo. That was insane. What were you thinking? I like literally was doing it right there, <laughs> on the couch. And I'm, uh, so I've got even fewer minutes left. Uh, this is my wonderful hidden animation that I, this was my fallback, you see? We're falling. Yeah, I'm definitely falling. I would really be keen on uh, this to go. Running, it's still not finding it. I've got this cache thing. Gosh, I'm quite flustered now. Oh! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, and so you can, <laughs> I'll start with a couple of these primitives. Uh, just before the computer gives out, we start with uh, creating our object and then with this pretty imperative, pretty clunky, in my opinion, kind of syntax, we have, uh, we add extra things that we want our objects to do uh, and they all it the library worries about how to do all of the interpolation to make all of the transitions happen with um, to occur within one sec uh, sorry your one second each and so this is an animation that lasts for roughly four or five seconds and we can do some sort of really fun things too and uh, for example I can change the color dynamically um, but I might park it, oh, actually, you know what, I'm going to stress my computer out a little bit by going and copying um, something from the example directory, because it's quite cool. The things that I found quite difficult when I was playing around with this is that the it seems to be very much designed for someone who knows exactly what they meant. Uh, it's kind of one of those things that you build for yourself and then kind of throw it over the fence. Um, I found some of the things relatively un... Um oh, why is that not... It's not It's not super happy. It's probably doing it and running it, playing it in the background. Yes. Uh, so again, we have these... Trans we create our, all of the... Uh, one of the things in particular is that all of the exist... All of the objects that you want in the scene, doesn't matter where they are, you kind of need to create them up front and then you apply the transformations through the course of your little program, which is something that I didn't really expect. I would normally think that I would uh, create an object, apply some transformations, you know, give it, move it to the right, then add the next thing. Uh, it doesn't seem to like that as much. Um, but that's Manum in like three minutes, and so <laughs> that's the lightning talk. Fortunately, you're no, no closer to battery running out. Yeah, I'm, I'm super surprised by that. Like, um, thanks Ubuntu for kind of keeping me alive, and that didn't break too. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Auto Hotkey has been around for quite a while. I think it came out of Auto IT, which a lot of IT people use to upload all of their computer programs when they're um, setting up a whole load of computers. It's had a popularity amongst gamers. Oh, sorry, who use it for um, remapping keyboards for doing games and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> so, simple example of that. Um, I'm just using control, out, and what's that one, D? And it just writes your email in there. Um, I'm a lefty, so on a uh, 
keyboard this size, the enter key is on the right hand side. As I normally do a lot of graphics, I've got my hand, right hand on the mouse, so I can remap the tilde key to enter, so that's quite good for remapping as well. One of the things with remapping, once you've actually got a program running with a remap key, you've got to suspend it to be able to then go back and use that for what it originally was for. Um, it also does text expanders as a very thing, Bob, so here it's just HW and there's space bar, and then it transforms to that, you can do it where you can do a text expander with the R expert, it just does it straight away, bang, um, with, with that. Um, there's a GUI interface. I thought I had that running. Oh, sorry, F1, there we go. Um, so you can do GUI interfaces as well. This was one of the things I was using with the barcode scanner. I want to scan and it needs to scan into a text field. Um, so you had to open up Excel or text um, notepad or something like that. I actually found you could just do it in um, uh, auto hotkey straight away, so it would actually just punch all the data all the way through. So one of the things which I do is uh, in the morning I read a whole lot of different um, articles on different things. It's not going to open them up, but there's a whole lot of different web pages that you can just set up and it just automatically just opens things up. So I find this sort of handy for simple little convenience things to do. One of the ones that I use quite a lot, which I think is a brilliant tool, is this um, uh, quick access pop-up. And basically, you can come into here and you can, so if you're deep going into your computer or you've got a lot of files in different places, you can just go and add an active folder so that it's up here straight away. This uses middle mouse button. And uh, you can also put a lot of your scripts and things up here as well, and it'll also trigger programs if you wanted to do that. So I find that's a really handy um, sort of productivity tool to use. Um, there's things like, no, oh, sorry, I've got to go back into that again. Um, in here, what's that? Uh, that one, this is just a cursor highlighter that's actually done in, in the program. Um, Sorry, RW. Another one, um, I should have started it at the beginning for this, um, but this is actually a timer that comes up. You can turn it into a stopwatch. You can turn it into a so start on the stopwatch. You can pause halfway through. So that's sort of handy for timesheet sort of stuff. There's another one which I found, which was a lovely little program, which um, uh, just set up that I've got for a whole lot of different projects that I work on. That as I'm actually working through, I can actually just put stuff because you're doing rats and mice during the day you can just pop it up and actually do that sort of thing um, there's a thing called power automate that's just come out it's just been made free on the desktop um, which does another bit of windows automation um, this one here there's a program called pullovers macros um, that shows you how you can do things like use little GUI boxes to actually pull down and start things and on the right it actually writes a script as well so you can actually start picking up how the script is actually written. The nice thing with this is it's transferable. If you get auto hotkeys on your own program you can just run the script so it's great for testing and doing all of that sort of stuff. If you want to share it with somebody who hasn't you can actually compile it into an exe file. The nice thing, well, good to, whereas normally if you do a compile, it actually tries to reduce the file size down. On this one here, um, the file size of this particular script, um, the one that I was demoing a couple of things there, um, is eight kilobytes. Yet when it actually comes to the .exe file, it's 1076. So all it actually does is it just does uh, a compiled uh, auto hot crease script and just bangs it into the file. So you can just share the executable around to everybody else. But one of the dangers which you need to be aware about it is it's a really handy thing. So if you've actually found a couple of little scripts that you find really useful and productive, just hand them around. Um, but the actual script itself is still um, readable at the very bottom. So if you have things like passwords or you're logging onto an FTP site or something like that, uh, it doesn't do that sort of thing very well. So just be aware of that. Um, uh, I've been using it as a barcode scanner and so the notion is that I can actually um, scan things off plants onto a QR code, a little um, QR code with that. Um, I'm using text-to-speech so that I don't actually have to look at the screen, it's actually um, tabbing through the things as it cycles down. i then going to take that and it sends it up with another script that will actually send it up to an FTP onto my server which will actually run on a, a, a task schedule time to send me an email where it run a report each day and send that back down again. So I'm trying to do 
a sort of automation loop all the way through. Um, as I was saying, power automation um, desktop has just come been made free to people, but that is totally locked off. It's if you get download it onto your computer, uh, it saves it up to your OneDrive account. Oh, sorry, yeah, OneDrive account, but it saves it not as a file, so you can't share it with anybody else. So it's a totally personalised tool that you actually use. Whereas this, it's been around for a long time. Uh, and it's easy to share um, with other people a lot of the, the stuff that you're doing. There's some great stuff out there, a lot more than what I used to use. I've been using the, the uh, hotkeys for years. Um, the other thing which I've actually found to, to use as well, I'll see if I can get this to find this time, um, is the two things which I use a bit is um, with the emails, I can use control one, control and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I've got one which does the whole thing with lots of little buttons of all the different um, web pages and stuff like that. The other one that I use is control two. Once is the date. I don't think I've got it doing the return. Um, it should, oh, sorry. Some of them, so you can actually use the same key combination or the same key and just tap it once, tap it twice, tap it three times or there's a, tap and a pause and things that you can actually do. So if you know that you've got, that's one of the things where you've got a few hotkeys is you're assigning to certain things, you suddenly run out of hotkeys. Uh, another thing which is what happens is you start creating a lot of small scripts is there's this one here which is a auto um, command picker and this one has a whole lot of scripts it just turns them into small functions that you can use and as soon as you start typing the, the WS and press enter, it starts doing that um, same sequence as it was doing last time. Um, that's quite handy because you can just chuck a whole load of your scripts in there, um, test them out to see if they work or see if they're usable. If they are convenient, then you keep them. If they're not, then you don't. Um, uh, so that one's there. And also within this particular program, you can also have your hotkeys. Now, um, uh, there was, uh, I'll give the um, script to grant so that it can be put up on the website for all of those other um, items there for the different ones that you want to use. Any questions? I've got a few questions for you um, to, to start out with. So have you, oh, and put up your hand. If, this, the, um, if the question applies to you. Have you ever heard anybody saying that developers are not good at design? Yeah, probably rough. And keep your hands up, please. Um, more than 50%. Keep your hand up if you have said that yourself. A few hands go down, but a few are still up. So, Kind of my first hypothesis is we need to design. Now you can put your hand down, Grant. Yes, thank you. We need designers on a project. Next question. Have you, have, so, so don't put up your hand right now, but answer again with your hand up. Have you had a smartphone in 2006? That was the year before Apple came out with the iPhone. Nobody. Oh, one person. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, are you still using that smartphone? It was a Palm Trio and... Okay. So, kind of, unfortunately, not by choice, I guess, that you can't use it anymore now because it can't connect anymore. Or would you still want to use it these days? Okay. Well, you're breaking my hypothesis, which is good. <laughs> but when we had a similar talk at Catalyst, kind of nobody said that they wanted to use their smartphone from 2006 anymore. It would have been kind of one of the oldest style ones. So we typically want the new and the contemporary to work with. Now, what does that have to do with the topic of my talk today? Well, let me tell you a little story. In the beginning, and my beginning starts in 2006, um, Penny Leet, who worked here as a developer, committed or uh, made the first commit into the Mahara code base on the 27th of September 2006. Mahara is the software 
that I'm working on open source ePortfolio tool. Already a few days later, a theme was mentioned because we are creating a web app, therefore it needed to look so I needed to have a theme because it needed a graphical user interface since you needed to access it on the internet. At that time, pretty much everybody on the project was a developer. And, um, but we kind of knew, or Catalyst at that time I wasn't on the project, knew that we needed a logo. Project needed a logo and thankfully our current designer, Yvonne, was hired um, just about a month later and one of her first activities was to actually come up with a logo for the project. Now, what do designers typically need in order to come up with a logo? They need a design brief. And like so many design briefs in the industry and everywhere else, it was short and snappy. In our case, remember, it was 2006. The design brief was make the logo web 2.0 shiny and make it pop. So that's what Ivan got and we got a shiny web 2.0 logo. It even came with the mirror effect and it popped because we also had some green in there so it had a bit of a color. And so over the next few years um, we made some slight changes to the logo because at some point Web 2.0 was not quite that modern anymore. And so we lost a bit of the shininess. Um, it still popped, but other than that, it kind of still was very recognizable as the very much same logo. But then in 2016, after having made some iterations in the software, new releases, um, kind of had different icons in there and we really thought, well, this logo isn't quite us anymore. And so we had um, made a quite a big rebranding activity and came up with this iteration. So it's very different from the other two. I mean, you still see the beginnings in it, so it's not a complete departure of the logo, but it has a very different feel to it. And what we did at that time as well is not like what we had done before, just create a logo, but we actually developed an entire brand so that we know who we are, what we want to do. So along with the logo, we also had a branding font so that when we created documents, we knew what font to use and didn't have to choose one of the 16 million that are out there. And the font goes with the logo. And we also created a whole bunch of colors. And when I say we, I really actually mean our designer. And so instead of just having pretty much three colors, one darkish brown, and then a darker green and a lighter green, suddenly we had a whole range of colors and we knew when we wanted to create a presentation or put more than one color together, we actually could choose from a whole range. And we knew they were going with each other. In tone and warmth and all of that. And the logo is also quite versatile. We can have it with the word Mahara, but we can also have it on its own. And there's a slight difference to it, as you can see. And we also have a mobile app. What do you think that logo looks like? Yes, very similar to the actual Mahara logo and therefore helps us also to stay in the family and help people to see, yes, this application goes with Mahara itself. And when we have events, we build on the logo and therefore really keep everything in one and nobody really ever has to think about, well, what logo am I going to come up with today? And can people still recognize it that it is the same product? And so we do that with all the branding that we do for merchandising, for um, banners, things we put on t-shirts or mugs and the like. But in this case here, we even kept our old logo um, purposely because we wanted to show the connection to the past and not entirely lose it. And it's just really fun to also have these characters. And we also use it for social media, as um, imagery, as well as thank you cards that we are sending to our contributors for every single release. And they all 
kind of show our own way what we look like. And as you can see also on my computer screen, we have a decal, um, big sticker really, that is also branded and that make flows into the same um, brand and um, looks very much of how we want to be perceived. So now what does that mean for your projects? Hopefully, potentially. Um, I think there are four elements that we should be considering. And the first one really is to define who you are, who we are. Because unless we know how we want to be perceived, how we think our audience wants us to be perceived, we might be missing the boat. So if you want to cater to a certain community and you know they work with crazy colors and very have a very comic book style, then you might want to adapt something similar to really appeal to them. Whereas when you work with children, you might have a completely different visual language than if you were working with retirees. Um, it also depends very much on the in the culture that you're operating, I find, um, because that also defines which colors you might be using more predominantly, which colors you might avoid, and also what you what your app could look like so really define who you are and then apply that to your project and don't just stop at the logo really think about the entirety of what you're creating think about well do we want to put things onto a, um, onto t-shirts other merchandising maybe even letterhead business cards and all of that develop a brand don't just develop a logo because it all kind of needs to go together and needs to gel and I find very importantly, do not be afraid to make changes over time. As you've seen kind of just on the three big iterations of the logo, that was over a time period of, um, yeah, a little over 10 years, um, 15 years coming on this year. And um, so roughly every six, seven years or so, we thought, well, we might want to make a change. And in between, there are just small changes that are not as visible. But don't be afraid of it because our aesthetics change. And that was the second question. Are you still using the um, smartphone from 2006? Could have also asked, are you still using the same apps from 2006? Because sometimes we look at software and think, oh, that looks a bit dated. Do I really want to work with that anymore? Whereas when something new and fresh comes along, then that is oftentimes more preferred. And we do that very unconsciously, oftentimes not even knowing why we like something compared to something else. And lastly, do not forget your th to thank your designer because they make a huge contribution to the success of any project that you're working on because it is those very unconscious um, notions that we have that help us also sell a product, help us um, be recognized and uh, help the product be, be used. And it's all those unicorns that work on a project that actually make it happen. Thanks. Okay, um, so this evening I'm going to talk to you guys about nomograms uh, and some software that I found useful for dealing with them. Um, so I suppose uh, the first thing is to say what is a nomogram, because a lot of people might not have heard of them. So it's basically a graphical calculator. It's not this kind of graphical calculator, it's this kind of graphical calculator. So some of you might have seen something like this if you went to a doctor's surgery. So what you do is you find your weight on the left hand side and your height on the right hand side and you join your weight and your height with a line and where it cuts the line in the middle is your body mass index. It's quite a common one that is out there. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about how they're made but um, mostly about how you can do it in software. There are lots of ways of making a nomogram. Uh, one of the ways that I have found most useful is you take your equation, so there's an equation for the body mass index, and you try and express it as uh, a determinant that's equal to zero uh, and has each variable only appearing once in a line and has a column of ones on the right hand side. And if you can do that, and usually it can be done, there's books that tell you how to do it, um, then you can basically draw points 
according to these equations and you'll get a nice picture like the one I just had. Um, often it turns out that this first go, this thing that you discover that mathematically works, produces a really horrible picture. So some lines are just way too long and some lines are really compressed. Um, but the good news is that the uh, geometers have got a really nice thing you can do. You can take four points on a really ugly picture and you can move those to four other points that make a really nice picture. And that just involves a little bit more maths. And that's the maths for the nice diagram you saw earlier. Okay, so um, you work this out. This is That's the hard part, what I just showed you. You know, it takes a little while sometimes to come up with the right formula. Once you've done it, you want to draw it. And unless um, you're a true artist or a masochist, you want to do that in software. It's going to take you a long time to do it by hand. So there are lots of ways you could do that, and I've tried a few um, over a few years, really. Um, but one of the ones I like is a thing called PIX, which is a Python package, or it might be PyX. I can't find anything that tells me definitively. It gets you started really fast. So it doesn't have much that you need to do. You import the package, you create a canvas, which I've called C here. You do all your drawing commands, and then you take your canvas, you put it in a page, you put pages in a document, and you make a PDF file. And that is it. Uh, the drawing commands are pretty easy too. So the first command here, kind of obvious, it creates a path which is a line from two points to two points, or from one point to one point with two coordinates each. Uh, it makes the color of that line red, and then it uses the stroke command to draw that line on the canvas. The second command creates uh, a path which is a circle centered at uh, the point x, y with radius one, and then it uses the stroke command to draw it on the canvas. And the third command uh, uses the text command, so the text command takes uh, an argument that gives the coordinates where the text should be placed, and the text itself, and a list of properties, and in this case one of the properties rotates the text by 45 degrees, and it draws it on the canvas. So it's really easy. Um, my interest in these things was motivated by uh, and a job that I no longer have, but um, needing to uh, plot an equation in four variables, which is particularly hideous, uh, but believe it or not, is is commonly used um, to meet regulatory obligations by all the large banks in the world at the moment. Um, so that's what it looks like when it's written down. And this is what it looks like when you put it into a nomogram, uh, which I think it still looks pretty bad, but it's much more comprehensible. So I'll just very briefly explain what it does. Um, if I take... Uh, I'm a bank and I want to lend some money to somebody. I want to lend $100 to this person. So the first thing I do is I work out how long the loan is going to be for. And so that's on the M line and I say it's going to be just for a bit more than two years. I take a point on there. And then I work out, I look at the customer and I do a credit appraisal and I say what's the probability that that person is going to default on the loan. And I've decided that that person, there's a 2% chance they'll default on the loan. So I join those two points up, and I extend them down to this line at the bottom. And then I say, okay, if that person does default on the loan, uh, and I have to sell the collateral, how much money will I lose after I've sold the collateral and got back what I can? And in this case, I've decided I'm gonna, they're going to lose about 40%. So I join that line I got at the bottom up to 40%. And in the middle, it intersects here at a value of about 8. And what that value means is, uh, if I'm lending this customer $100, at least $8 of that money that I'm lending them has to come from the bank's shareholders and not from my depositors. Um, so the, the funny thing is that's actually quite a high number. Usually it's a lot less than that. Um, just an example. If you want to know more about this, uh, you can find at the PIX project, there's a website there. And if anyone's interested in looking at uh, the nomogram, there's a really neat book that's been written by these three guys, Alcock, Jones and Michelle, um, and it's available free. Uh, you can't download it, unfortunately, it's some sort of web interface thing, but um, it's a really interesting read. And there are some beautiful pictures in there, much nicer than the ones that 
I showed you today. That's all. Thank you. My talk is entitled White Space is a Lie, where Unicode, Unicode is harder than it looks, especially when it's invisible. Uh, I just want to sort of start with an acknowledgement. Um, uh, a lot of the research that went into this comes from a blog post that was posted a few years ago, uh, and has some, it, you know, I was like, really? <laughs> is it that bad? Um, so I just kind of want to like uh, maybe illustrate the problem, um, JavaScript, everyone's favorite programming language. Uh, like, if you were to like copy and paste, which I won't do for the camera, um, this, any guesses what this evaluates to? It's obvious, right? No, it's 38, no? It will evaluate to 42. So I'll just leave that and we'll move forward and come back to it. So just ponder how this could be the case. So first of all, we need a kind of a definition of like, what is white space? You know, we have this kind of intuitive understanding uh, as speakers, uh, sorry, you know, of using a language that uses uh, spacing between words to, de to delimit to words. Not all languages are like that, but ours is. Uh, and so we kind of come with this kind of naive, let's say naive, we've got a space character at the top, a tab character, a carriage return, which will send the carriage back to the start of the line because we're all still typing with typewriters, and then the line feed, the new line character, right? This is kind of what I as an ASCII, you know, like what I would look for in my Python code. Uh, that's wrong. So now, we, like, we'll be re we'll be even more sophisticated. We'll look for regular expressions, and so this special character, if you've ever implemented or used regular expressions, uh, means space, right? And this is all vertical spaces, so that would be the vertical tab, and there are a couple of others. And this is all horizontal white space. So we've got, and so in some sense, space should be the union of any vertical space or any horizontal space. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, so this is the did, 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 these are the Unicode code points. It turns out that there are some exceptions. The no break space uh, depends on the rules that are being applied uh, to your implementation. There's also the line feed. The next line character is not the new line character. Uh, and also, by the way. Um, Prior to 5.18, pill compatible regular expressions didn't include vertical tab as a white space character. So that's, that's all fun. So these are all of the horizontals, these are all of the verticals, and it's actually not the union of, uh, so this syntax means both of them combined as one group, or as, 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 as one group, and it doesn't exist. So you say, well, maybe some other people have defined white space, and so there's this POSIX standard, which is all things that say that I am Unix comply with, right? And they've got this, this kind of group of characters. Space. Does that mean white space? Well, actually, no. <laughs> it's not. It, it depends on the computer. There's a setting that you can have. Say, like, well, what, 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 what is this? It turns out, uh, oh, by the way, yeah, so it's like, but the space group is actually not quite the space that we just we just had. Uh, if you look, it includes these characters, which is a different way, as well as anything else you want to include, unless that they are already a space formed by a new line, uh, or any of the characters. I think in um, defined as sort of a digit or. Uh, oh yeah, digit, graph, x digit, which is the like hexadecimal numbers. So space could literally, if someone really, if you really wanted to play with someone's computer, change a locale setting, lc underscore something, um, <laughs> and then you can define space to mean pretty much whatever you want, and you will still be POSIX compliant. 
So it, like, it, it comes back to this question, like what is 2 plus negative 40? It turns out that this is the Ogham space mark, which is defined as white space in the standard, but is rendered as a bar. It is a way of encoding space in an old Irish language called Ogham that used to delimit, that uses a bar to delimit, to delimit words. So that is legal white space as applied by the standard. So you need to go to the rescue, right? Right? It's really clear. Every single code point, which is kind of a sequence of numbers, let's say, or sequence of bits, um, is assigned to a category. Surely there's a category for white space. It turns out there's kind of sort of two definitions of white space in the standard, and there are three categories that look like they might mean enough. Separator space, separator line, and separator paragraph. But guess what? None of those are what you what you think, because carriage return, line feed, tab, and even the vertical tab are not included in those categories. They are control characters. They are not defined as white space in the Unicode standard. So if you want to be Unicode compliant and just use the Unicode definition of white space, your naive interpretation of what white space means will not be correct. Just to kind of like, last of all, if you really were puzzled and you really think, oh gosh, I wish there was a very easy way out here. By the way, there's not. As a programmer, it's your job to figure this out. A spirit for, thought for this character, which is rendered as quite a wide space, which is not defined as white space. It just happens that most fonts render it as a gap. But there is nowhere where it will be classed as white space. None of the standards. And that's because it's Braille. It is, the, it is the character for encoding no indented Braille dots. So some fonts will have open circles, 24 of them, but not this font. So we have seen instances where white space or like blank things are not white spaces and fit, like drawings are white spaces. Please don't look at that problem naively ever again. With that, I leave you there. Thanks. Um, my name is Carl Klitscher. I'm currently Secretary of the New Zealand Open Source Society. Uh, one of my many roles is to pick up some of the random emails that I get, and I got a random email from uh, a couple who lived up in uh, Waikanae, saying that their brother had departed this earth. He was the grand old age of 96. He'd been a radar technician for most of his life, and obviously had uh, he drove a, a Prius, so he was kind of you know pretty keen on these things. One of the other things he did was um, he'd been collecting Linux format magazine since day one. So I've got something like 300 copies of Linux format sitting in my garage wondering what to do with them. Uh, but I just thought we'd like to go a little bit back. So here's Linux format, uh, the UK's only dedicated Linux magazine from May 2000. And on the front, join the revolution. So. Uh, how many people weren't even born in 2000? <laughs> yeah, a little bit of history. I've got um, a set of them up the back there. If you can have a, have a look, uh, and if you've got any ideas on what to do with them, by all means, send me a, uh, send me a note. Oh. Uh, oh. Right, so uh, back to my open source hat. Um, uh, one of the other hats that I wear is to do with the Institute of IT Professionals. Uh, which is a sort of like professional organization that has a lot of, they do a lot of work in the um, using qualifications arena, you know, what sort of things are we teaching kids um, as they come through. Um, and, you know, generally how, you know, they, they manage the professionalism of the organizations. Um, they've done a lot of work with MB, as you might expect. Um, and MB a few months ago, years ago now, started doing a bit of paper, you know, we're, we're short on digital skills, you know, we, we've got a real issue coming up. Uh, in New Zealand, and we haven't got enough people to uh, fill the roles. Okay, absolutely fine. Um, 
one of the things that we did was run a little workshop on some of the uh, crossover points about how people are finding it difficult to get certain roles or certain career changes. Um, so, for example, when you come out of tertiary, you've been told, oh, IT is the way to go. You come out of tertiary um, looking for your first IT role and you're finding it incredibly hard because 99.999% of New Zealand organisations will say, you've got no experience, we're not going to hire you. Anyone suffered from that? Oh, Tim, look at that. Um, the next stage, of course, is when you're in mid-career um, and you're looking at changing the thing. You know, you, you've been doing development, you've been doing programming, you've been doing um, you know, whatever it is you've been doing for a while, uh, and you want to change your, your career. So you start taking some courses uh, and then start applying for different roles, and of course you get the no experience in job X, uh, and it goes all the way through. So um, you're actually looking at somebody who left IBM after 32 years, Five years ago, I have just applied for my 103rd job, uh, still with no luck. So apparently there's an IT shortage in New Zealand, so uh, there you go. Anyway, we were looking through these things, uh, and we came up with some ideas. Uh, and one of the ideas, you know, a lot of those ideas made it into the, um, uh, into the uh, NZ Tech digital you know, white paper for, for government. And there were lots of things in there. Um, you know, it's basically, well, what do you do to change the, the curriculum? How do you make people interested in, in going ahead and what, doing what you're doing? Uh, and there were things like, uh, suggestions like apprenticeships. You know, maybe there could be a software apprenticeship like there is for the construction industry or something like that. And I sort of looked at that and thought, actually, having had some experience with government departments, um, and I'm quite disturbed at how my tax dollar is being used at some of these places, for example, uh, I did some work for ACC. Uh, ACC, they have a massive data, in, uh, data uh, environment, um, data lake, whatever you want to call it, uh, and they were using a company called MapR out of the US to basically define and manage that for them. MapR is a commercial company, uh, but they built their product on Hadoop, open source. So it's all open source with some nice, fine, shiny bits around it. Um, the government said, oh, we'll have that. Uh, so ACC and IID both bought into that. Uh, absolutely fantastic. They built themselves a massive data lake. ACC had about 12 programmers working on it, so there's lots of people with lots of uh, really good skills in that space. Uh, MAPR got, uh, ran out of money. They got bought by HP, who shut them down. So ACC's thrown up its hands and said, oh, we have no more support. Let's go and buy this other thing called Snowflake from uh, this other US company and send all the money offshore. And those wonderful um, Hadoop people that we've got, we'll just throw them away because there's no need for us to maintain open source software. And I thought, actually, there is. So um, we've now got people at ACC and people at IRD with some fantastic open source skills and know where to use them. We know that government uses open source an awful lot. So how about we start treating some of this stuff as though it was infrastructure, like a bridge, a road, a hospital, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and what we then do is we say, okay, we will take, not everyone, we will take as many people as we can who've just come out of tertiary and we will put them into maintaining the open source base code that is used by government departments. Right? So we're talking about things like uh, you know, NPM. Everyone knows what NPM is? Uh, it's part of the uh, Node.js JavaScript thing. The security industry in New Zealand and worldwide has absolute kittens over this stuff because you get all of this code coming in from the overseas. Nobody does any vetting. Nobody knows what's going on. And you end up with data breaches like you wouldn't believe. How about we take that NPM code and we actually take those people from tertiary who are starting to get their business, you know, want to get a bit of experience. We get them in. We get them to maintain the NPM database. We actually get to test the NPM environment. So we actually do proper real-time tests. We go through, we do the maintenance, and that then means that any government department or any other New Zealand business that signs on gets access to code that is already validated and available for them. Right? So that's well, one of the ideas. Um, well, that, that's basically the, uh, the core of it. The rest of this is how do we actually fund that? You know, again, I'm saying this is a... Um, uh, you know, we, we should be treating it as infrastructure, we should be treating it as roads, we should be giving those people, you know, um, a starter thing. The benefits of this is that the people get, uh, they get real-world um, job skills, they get real-world experience. 
we have a sign above everyone's desk saying, yes, you can poach me. So these guys, they will get a, they're assigned to work. They'll get assigned to work for any given government department. Any government department can request an update on any piece of open source that they want. These guys will go through. They'll do the maintenance. They'll make sure all the interface goes to upstream if the upstream guys want it. Um, but they then get to work with those government departments. They get a portfolio together. People get to know what these guys are actually doing and how good they are. Um, we were looking at how would you do this. Um, I'm kind of looking at a livable wage, which I think is 25 to $30 an hour. The idea is that we don't want you to be comfortable in this role. This is a stepping stone into something else. Uh, and we would hire you for a maximum of two years. Uh, and that would get you into space. So um, there's a lot of other ways of how we fund this. We know that, for example, a Catalyst do um, uh, internships. Uh, so there's internships there. We know ANZ does internships. We know that the universities have internships. None of these people talk to each other because they're all struggling to get people involved. You know, there's costs involved in doing the internships. A lot of small New Zealand businesses can't afford the mentoring overhead to do that. So this program would actually take care of that as well. There would be people in there to actually manage those internships, manage the HR, manage the mentoring. So that's my grand plan. What I'm looking for is people to shoot it down. What problems are there in there um, that I need to address before I start taking this through to government? Um, the first big one, of course, is that everyone loves Azure uh, and it can do no wrong. I'm going, hmm, okay, fine. The challenge with that is that all that money is going offshore. Every dollar that gets spent with Microsoft or a US company goes offshore. If the money stays in New Zealand, at least 25% of that goes back into the economy. So you can afford to fund 125% of somebody before it becomes the same cost as Azure. Make sense? Am I talking crap? Who knows? Alrighty, there's the website. Um, have a look at it. Uh, I'm on secretary at nzoss.nz. Uh, if you've got any ideas or think it's a stupid idea or think it's a fantastic idea, let me know. Any questions? As soon as I could get it done. <laughs> no, seriously. There, there's a couple of other issues, sorry, I didn't mention it. One of the things I was very concerned about is that Catalyst does a lot of business with government, right? There's a Catalyst cloud, there's wonderful stuff going on there. They're not on the panel, can't get in there. There's a huge issue with procurement within government, so we all know that. What I wanted to be very clear about is that we are not, well, the plan is to not interfere with Catalyst's business model, right? So Catalyst are doing all of the, you know, new innovative stuff. Um, I think Kogo, was we were talking about earlier, there's lots and lots of businesses out there that are doing really innovative stuff. That stays with them. All we're looking at is the base code. We want a base set of code that basically works. Uh, again, one of the things that came out of Red Hat recently, um, one of the biggest impediments, I think 42% of their customers said the biggest impediment to them using open source was the lack of documentation. So these guys will produce a documentation. They would produce nice, easy, easy ways of people, you know, I don't know, Ansible scripts or Kubernetes containers. Any New Zealand business that wanted to get started up would basically be able to come to this group and say, you know, give me a container that does X, give me a container that does Y. And the rest of it is up to them. All singing, all dancing. Can I take it for the wall? One of the things that I mentioned earlier about this group um, and, and my vision for how it should work is that um, we get talks from people who've done talks at other groups um, and um, recycle them. This is one of those. Um, I was talking to the JavaScript user group um, in December. So let's try <laughs> oh God. Well, I'm never going to find that. That's a job for another day. <laughs>
going without a remote. Okay, so, no, no, I've thrown the adapter into the mass of cables in the bottom of the lectern, um, and now I need a torch. Anyway, who's heard of these guys? Yay, Tim, one person has. So, these two guys, Simon and Mark, run a channel on YouTube called Cracking the Cryptic, and um, if you subscribe to that channel, you can watch two middle-aged men solve Sudoku. And it might not sound compelling, but it is strangely so. Um, I discovered them um, about 18 months ago, um, but they re their popularity really took off. They got three. 133,000 subscribers or something. Um, it really took off um, over lockdown in, in the UK and the US where, where people um, wanted something to take their mind off their worries. Um, now, the way that it works is they post a video where there's a Sudoku puzzle and they have a link to their app where you can go and solve that puzzle or make an attempt and, and then go back to the video and, and compare how you did it to how they did it and maybe work out how to get past the point you got stuck, that sort of thing. So that was kind of where their channel started. Actually, their channel started, they, they were going to do the same thing but solving cryptic crosswords, which is their other passion, but they found that people didn't watch those videos, so they, they focused just on the Sudoku. Um, so, um, their app, one of the things that I really like about their app, and they explain the reasoning behind it, um, these little numbers are referred to as pencil marks, um, but this, their app has two sorts of pencil marks, one's in the corners of the squares and one's in the middle. And the, the difference is the ones in, in the centre are telling you something about just that cell. So this one is saying this cell can only be a five or an eight. Whereas up here, these ones in the corners relate to this three by three box. And it's saying in this three by three box, the one is either there or it's there. And that's useful for a number of reasons. So for example, here, I know it's in column two, and I've got a one in column three, so the one down here must be here. Even though there's four other spaces, I know there won't be a one in these ones because the one must be there. Um, another thing it's useful for is if through some other means you found out that there was a seven, well, whatever, in this, when you put the digit in there, there's now only one place one could go, so it must go there. So anyway, that's their app. It allows you to do the two types of pencil marks, which I hadn't seen on an app before. Um, the other thing they do is what they call Sudoku variants. So um, it, in, in this case, they've added other elements into it. And it's certainly not their invention or anything. Um, these square um, backgrounds indicate that whatever the number is in here, it's an even number and the round ones indicate that's an odd number. And that allows them, with these extra constraints, to give you fewer starting digits. Um, this is uh, a different variant where the numbers that you put along the arrow, if you add them together, that number must go in there. And in this case, all these lines add up to the same thing. And now you've got very few starting digits, um, and they have lots of puzzles with no starting digits at all. Um, and you think, well, how could you possibly solve that? And you can go along and watch and find out. Now, what I liked about their app, and, and they explained all about this, this two types of pencil marks, um, unfortunately, what I didn't like about their app was that you could only play the puzzles that they put up. So you couldn't, like, if you found one in the newspaper that was hard and you wanted to use this advanced pencil marking, um, you couldn't put that grid in, in, into their app. So I decided, right, I'm going to write my own that is uh, compatible with theirs. 
um, supports those two types of pencil marking. It allows undo and color highlighting. Um, should also work on a um, mobile device or a you know, tablet or a phone. Um, and in particular, it would allow you to enter any puzzle. Um, and you could share a puzzle as a link. Um, only just noticed this bar down the bottom. Go away. <laughs> I can't make it go away. If I use the pointer for the computer that I'm on, that might be more successful. Um, so you can um, access this app at sudokuexchange.com. Um, the word exchange is in there because all the good names were gone, uh, but also to emphasize that it's about sharing puzzles. If you've got a good one, you can, you can share it. Um, you, it's also open source, um, so you can check out the code and make it better. Um, send me pull requests or just use your modified version yourself if you want to. Um, when you go to the site, it offers you a bunch of um, categories, four difficulty categories, and you open one up and it'll give you some number of puzzles in there. Um, and those puzzles update every hour. Um, so there's always some, some fresh different puzzles there. Um, you, you could uh, click this button to go in and type numbers into the grid, or you could use this one um, to paste a puzzle. Now, here I'm hovering over this one, and down the bottom you can't read it, but the link ends with a string of 81 digits. So that is the, the Sudoku puzzle, this one, um, and the zeros are the blank spaces. So that concept of representing a Sudoku puzzle as a string of 81 digits is reasonably widespread, so you can get puzzles from different sites as a string of digits, sometimes with dots instead of zeros, and you can just paste one in there and, and fire up the puzzle. Um, we saw this in my earlier talk, that's all SVG based. Um, it has, on, on this top bar, um, has uh, a timer which um, you might like or you might not. So you can go into the settings um, and you can turn the timer off. Um, you can select a dark mode theme if you want, don't want to be assaulted with all that white. A um, bunch of other, other options. Um, most of the apps that you find don't have a lot of options. Um, a menu for various things. Um, one of them is if you get stuck, you can select this option to open the same puzzle in another site um, which has a really good solver um, and um, the puzzle will be passed over there as a string of 81 digits. Um, it's also really easy to share a puzzle um, with friends and family. Um, and another thing which uh, I was talking about at, at the Lightning Talk meeting a year ago was this concept of, of bookmarklets, where if you're on a site like the New York Times that has a puzzle, you can have a bookmark that has some JavaScript in it that looks at the DOM, pulls out the digits, creates a link to the Sudoku Exchange site, and opens that exact same puzzle on, um, on my site. Um, and currently, about 100 people a day do that. Um, opening, they go to New York Times because they have a good good daily puzzle, uh, but they don't like the app, and so they open it um, on my app instead. Um, and I have bookmarklets for a bunch of different um, apps that you can scrape the puzzle and, and transfer it over. Um, and another one that's really popular is scraping the uh, puzzles from the Cracking the Cryptic app, um, because my player is um, now better than theirs. No, different. Not really better, just different. Um, so it's JavaScript um, and React. Um, 
it uses um, a library called immutable.js, and there's an asterisk there because I was using immutable.js, and I had this bug that would strike me every now and then that I just couldn't understand why the state in my app was getting broken. So the game would play fine, and then the state would be messed up. And I decided that this immutable.js library was really big, and I was only using a tiny part of it. And I could probably write my own code to do what I needed. So I wrote bit by bit each of the routines from Immutable that I actually needed. And literally, the last one, as I was coding it, I looked at the line that used it and realized I'd written it wrong, and that was why it was failing all the time. So it's a useful exercise. Um, so I don't actually use Immutable.js. I use one called NotMutable.js that I wrote myself. Um, it renders via SVG. Um, it has a um, menu option to save the current puzzle as, as a PNG image. Um, there's a community of, of people who share puzzles um, on Reddit um, as, as one place, but others as well where they share them as images. Um, and you can, it, it uses the React QR code library so if you had a puzzle open on your phone, for example, you could um, share as a QR code. Your mate could open the same one, and then you could race to solve it. Good times. Any questions? It needs to not be too easy. It needs to make you think. Ah, oh. yeah, right, right, right. So, okay. Um, sorry. Well, if I show you, uh, I was going to reach for that mouse again, which was not going to work. So if we go to the site and launch the app and There was a little animation played there while it was going away and getting the list of, of um, puzzles. Getting the list of puzzles doesn't take that long. I, I built in a delay because I really like the animation, and having it disappear in like 25 milliseconds was annoying. Um, so, um, so if we pick one of these um, relatively hard ones, um, now if I open that in the solver, I was just thinking, will this do the right thing with the keyboard? Because I did some work in that area, but the answer was no. Um, right, so. All of these things down here are techniques for revealing a, a digit. So these are the really easy ones that you would probably intuitively recognize, like there's only one number missing from this line is, is the, one of the first ones there. So um, as, as I, um, so it, it's narrowed things down to all, all the candidates, and as I click take step, it reduces the, the candidates even further by um, applying each of these techniques, and down here you, you'll get a bit more information about the highlighted technique, but um, if that's not enough, this is a link to their wiki page for that particular technique that has a number of worked examples, so that once you understand that one, you'll hopefully be able to apply it yourself. Um, so to me, that's what makes a really good solver. Yep. Anything else? <laughs> I'll, a I'll answer a different question because I don't know the answer to that. But hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands. Um, one of the um, things that I did, I needed to do for my site was generating a whole bunch of puzzles. 
and um, I found a, an open source package that could do that and it could um, make them in, in the four different difficulty grades. Um, but it turns out it was really bad at grading them. So um, some you'd ask for a hard one and it would give you an easy one. Um, and so I found another piece of open source software that doesn't generate puzzles but is really good at grading them. Um, and so I fed the random mess through that and produced the, the graded ones. But there's sort of a, a um, normal distribution and, and the, the really easy techniques, I've got lots of puzzles with those. And I don't have lots of puzzles with um, some of the, the more difficult techniques because they don't occur so often in these somewhat randomly generated puzzles. And so I decided using the same software, I would generate lots of puzzles, run them through the grader and throw away the ones that weren't interesting. And I was just finishing that job over the weekend. So if anybody wants a list of 11 million Sudoku puzzles, I have some cast-offs for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well that's our meeting for tonight. So by all means mingle. Um, I think I need to actually have you out of the building in a small number of minutes. Um, it's common for people to uh, meet at the bar at the George down on the corner of Willis and Bullcott. Um, so if you want to try that, then by all means go there. I might be there later when I've finished packing things up, when I've found this adapter in the bottom of the thing. So thanks everyone. Um, see you in a month. <laughs>